More Miraculous Signs When we consider the miraculous events surrounding Jesus' final hours on the cross, we should be intensely motivated to proclaim that He is indeed God's eternal Son. Here's Gene. It's interesting that Matthew records four miraculous events that relate to the crucifixion of Jesus. The first one was darkness that came on the earth. Matthew 27, 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. Now, there's some discussion as to whether this was universal. Some believe it was universal. Others believe that it involved Judea and Galilee, where Jesus had gone. And this darkness came over that particular part of the world because they would have known, to some extent at least, of what was going to happen in Jerusalem or what would happen or what did happen in Jerusalem. So there's this miraculous um, darkness that came over over the whole land. And as I said, we're not sure exactly how much of the world that that covered. But it's interesting that Zephaniah indicates in one prophetic statement, I believe, that relates to what happened that day. I call this darkness and gloom. In Zephaniah 1.15, Old Testament prophet, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Now, when you look at the whole concept of that prophecy, it probably relates to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the judgments that are going to exist on the earth, even prior to His coming through the great tribulation that is described in the book of Revelation. But frequently, you see, God led these prophets to make statements that had multiple application. And certainly what He said, what Zephaniah said here, applies to that day when darkness came on the earth from noon until three in the afternoon. God is sending a message to those who crucified Him and to all who were observing this situation. And He was sending a message to all of us because Matthew, by the Spirit of God, has recorded it here for us to read. It's a message really of gloom, but it's also a message of hope. And the hope is that out of this darkness, we can find light. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so there's certainly a symbolic reference here that out of this darkness is going to come light through Jesus' death, but then His resurrection. And that is that He indeed is the Savior of the world. Now the second miracle relates to the curtain in the sanctuary, that is, in the temple. There in Jerusalem, when we read about this in Matthew 27, verse 51, suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. Now that's a miraculous event, you see, associated with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, there's some debate as to what was that curtain, because there's a curtain that separated the Gentiles from the Jews. And it could have been that curtain. And if so, Paul may have been referring to this in the book of Ephesians when he says that uh, that wall of partition is broken down. And in Christ, there is no separation between those who are Jews and those who are Gentiles. We're all one in Jesus Christ. So it could be referring to that curtain, but it also could be referring to that huge curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And that would be significant because of the thickness of that curtain. And if so, if that's the reference to that, what what God is saying to us is no longer because of Jesus' death, as and resurrection, no longer are we restricted to enter the presence of God. So both could be a possibility, and both have tremendous implications in relationship to um, 
our position as Christians and also what God is demonstrating that this event or these miraculous events here, the four of these events are communicating that this was the Son of God. Hebrews 10, by the way, gives us reference to that new and living way. Indeed, if this refers to that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. In other words, this would be symbolic. When that curtain was ripped, it also relates to His flesh. The nails that pierced His hands, the sword that pierced His side. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, and here's the good news. The good news, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And don't make the mistake of saying that that's baptism or water. This is not referring to water. This is referring to cleansing. And that cleansing relates to the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, in the Old Testament tabernacle, they had the labor for cleanliness. And what this is saying is that we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are able, because of Christ, our high priest, to enter the very presence of God. If it weren't for Jesus interceding for us, His death and resurrection, no one could enter the holy presence of God. And because of what happened there, we'll actually be able to see God in eternity, which is beyond comprehension. Now, the third and fourth miracles involved both an earthquake and the bodily resurrection of a certain number of believers. And this is somewhat puzzling. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints, that is, believers, who had fallen asleep, that is, who had died, were raised. And they came out of the tombs after His resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many." Now, as I said, it's hard to explain that, except it simply states that there, were, there was a bodily resurrection of those who were believers. And they had bodies that were visible, and probably eventually or shortly were taken into heaven which would be an illustration of what's going to happen when the church is removed from this earth. We don't know the total answer to that, obviously, but we know it was a sign, a miraculous sign to help people believe who Jesus really was. And then this uh, incredible sign in relationship, uh, all of these signs together affected the centurion that's there at the foot of the cross. And notice what we read. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were terrified and they said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Which relates back to our principle. And let me just restate that principle uh, again. And that is when we consider the miraculous events surrounding Jesus' final hours on the cross... We should be intensely motivated to proclaim that He is indeed God's eternal Son. He is the Son of God. And here's the question for reflection and response and application. How did the Apostle Thomas experience following the resurrection correlate with the experience of the Roman centurion who stood at the cross and declared, this man really was God's Son? Well, if you know the story of Thomas, after Jesus died and uh, came forth from the tomb, the apostles were scared to death. They didn't know what was happening. And they went into an upper room. They locked the doors because there was tremendous hostility towards them. They were fearful. And suddenly Jesus just appeared, came through the wall, as it were, because He's no longer restricted in His glorified body. And they see him. Well, Thomas wasn't there. 
And so when Thomas came, they said, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. He said, I won't believe unless I see him and put my hands into the nail prints and into his side. Well, a week went by, and they were in the same upper room, and Thomas was there, and suddenly there was Jesus. And the fascinating part of the miracle, he says, Hi, Thomas. Take a look. Put your hand there. See, nobody had seen Jesus since he had made those statements, I won't believe. How did he know Thomas even made that statement? And that moment we read in John 20, 28, Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. There's your connection. He was indeed the Son of God. The Apostle John really illustrates this principle in his whole gospel. Because at the end of his gospel, he gives us the purpose in what he recorded. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. That is the book of John. In other words, even prior to the cross, during those three years that he was with these men, he had performed many miracles. And they saw those miracles, the healings, the multiplications of bread and all that. And so John simply says that there were many, many other signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples that are not written here in the book of John. But he said, these, that is, these signs are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in His name. And it's really fascinating because He selected, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, seven miracles to record that demonstrate that Jesus Christ is God. He turned water to wine. What kind of wine was it? It was the best wine. What did it demonstrate? Jesus is the master of, of quality. The next miracle is that he healed a little boy who was there in Capernaum when he was in Cana. He just said the word that shows that Jesus was the master of distance. See, it was 15 miles. It could have been 15 billion light years and wouldn't have made any difference because he created all. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and all that was created was created by him. The next miracle, he was in Jerusalem. Man had been lame for 30, 38 years. Jesus said, walk. Demonstrates that he's a master of time. 38 years was nothing to the Son of God. Then he fed, remember the next sign? Fed 5,000 beside women and children. How many baskets did they have left? 12 from those two loaves, those, two, those small, those fish. Master of what? Quantity. He's not restricted. He could have created that bread from stones. He could have created it from nothing because that's what he did with the world. The next miracle, he walked on the water. He stilled the storm, master of nature. Next miracle, he healed that blind man who had been blind from birth. And remember what John said? Jesus said, as he recorded his words, he was this way so he could demonstrate who God really is, which means that Jesus is also the master of human destiny. And then, of course, you know what happened with Lazarus. Raised him from the dead, which indicates he's the master of death. See, these were seven selected signs that John recorded to prove that Jesus Christ is God. And then there's the greatest one, the greatest sign. He raised his own body from the grave. Remember what he said, destroy this temple? They thought he was referring to the temple. Destroy this temple, three days I'll raise it up. He was master of his own life. This was Jesus Christ. And so when John wrote and said, these things are written, they are recorded that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God himself. And of course... We see that right from the very beginning of the Gospel of John when he said, as I quoted earlier, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, 
And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's remember this principle that grows out of these miracles that happened, these four events there at the time Jesus died. When we consider the miraculous events surrounding Jesus' final hours on the cross, we should be intensely motivated to proclaim that He is indeed God's eternal Son.